Thank you. I know I should have bounded up the stairs the way politicians are trained to, but I have this leg injury and I won't be able to run for public office until it heals. Uh, uh, and if you're all freezing, I, I, I am too, so don't feel bad about it. Uh, um, I live in uh, New York City in Manhattan um, on the 17th floor. And I have a view, uh, I think a very beautiful view of the uh, um, skyline of Midtown. But um, there's almost nothing of nature that I see when I look out my window. I see glass and concrete and steel. Um, and I wake up in the morning. I always wake up at sunrise whenever that is. Um, so this time of year, I get to sleep a little later. Um, and the first thing I hear at sunrise is birds singing. And it always startles me. I always think, where did they come from? And that's very much the way New Yorkers think of New York, as a place that's apart, apart from nature, separate from nature, um, doesn't really have much to do with nature. Um, and it's completely forgotten that uh, New York City was built on the estuary of the Hudson, a great estuary of tidal ponds and creeks and wetlands and uh, all of the uh, natural wonders that are associated with estuaries. Um, <clears throat> and... You know, I sometimes think about um, what's under all that stuff that was built there. You know, because in the summertime, vacant lots start looking like tropical rainforests. You know, if you just have a little bit of dirt in Manhattan, uh, it will just grow with incredible speed. Um, fortunately, we have some idea of what it was like because the first uh, Europeans uh, to go there uh, wrote a considerable amount about it um, ecstatically. Um, and uh, they wrote of Manhattan as an island that was full of deer and elk and lynx and mountain lions and foxes um, with lakes and ponds and streams full of trout and uh, uh, the rivers uh, full of fish. Um, actually, even today, there are more than 200 different types of uh, uh, fish in the Hudson River. Um, all kinds of things that New Yorkers would never suspect are there, um, like seahorses, you know, seahorses. Bob, pat, gallop past, hop, what do seahorses do? I don't know. <laughs> they, they move past Manhattan every day. Um, and the, uh, the Dutch, when they came there, um, uh, found all of these species of, uh, of fish that they had never seen before, and they gave them numerical names, uh, which is kind of a Dutch thing to do, I guess. Um, uh, so they called shad, which they had never seen, elf, which means 11, the striped bass was 12. Um, there was a particular fascination with striped bass, um, which, like oysters, they believed to be an aphrodisiac. Uh, a man named uh, Isaac de Rassier in New Amsterdam, commercial agent, wrote in 1620 of striped bass, it seems that this fish makes the Indians lascivious, for it is often observed that those who have caught any when they have gone fishing have given them on return to the women who look for them anxiously. I mean, I've been fishing for striped bass all of my life. <laughs> Nobody's ever been that anxious for me to bring one home. Um, you know, but this place was this place was so rich in nature that you actually had your choice of aphrodisiacs, um, and uh, at the bottom of all of these waterways, 
in New York were beds of oysters um, because the uh, uh, the oyster that is native to the Atlantic coast of North America is an animal um, that lives in water that is less salty than the sea, uh, but you know saltier than fresh water. So a place in which uh, fresh water constantly runs into salt water is the ideal environment uh, for oysters. And so there were oysters everywhere. Uh, um, all through the, the bed of the Hudson. Uh, you know, the Hudson River is a, is a saltwater river um, up to a few miles past New York City. Um, and uh, that was full of oysters. The East River was full of oysters. The oysters grew all around Staten Island. Liberty Island and Ellis Island were called Big Oyster and Little Oyster Island. And um, on the uh, coast of Brooklyn and the Rockaway Peninsula, um, all five of what are the boroughs of New York today were oyster producing. Um, and uh, um, it was a... Um, uh, a huge resource and greeted with tremendous excitement by the Dutch. Um, uh, New, New Amsterdam and New Netherlands was a commercial enterprise. It was actually very different from the British colonies that were established in North America. It, it, there was no interest in the part of the Dutch on uh, creating settlements. It was, uh, it, it was owned by the Dutch West Indies company for the purpose of, uh, of making a profit. So they got very excited when they heard about the oysters because they, at the time, had uh, the Brazilian coast and were making a lot of money on pearls. Um, but what they didn't understand, which you may not understand also, is that oysters actually don't come from pearls. Um, did you know that? Uh, oysters come from an animal which is incorrectly called uh, a pearl oyster, but is actually biologically more closely related to a mussel than an oyster and apparently not particularly good to eat um, and tends to be tropical. And there are none of those in New York. So it was a big disappointment to the um, Dutch West Indies Company, uh, as was most everything, you know, after all these ecstatic writings about the, this this. Uh, land which they kept comparing to Eden and, and all of the descriptions uh, referred to uh, the sweetness of the air. They would say, you know, they rounded Sandy Hook and suddenly they were just overwhelmed by the sweetness of the air, you know, Manhattan. Um, and uh, um, they were having trouble finding anything profitable. Um, but in the meantime, the people who lived there uh, we're eating a lot of oysters, uh, and they were very large, and there were also lots of descriptions of how large they were. They were probably large because, you know, the oysters that we eat most of the time now are cultivated oysters, so it's costing somebody money to plant them and grow them. So the idea is to harvest them as early as you can, as soon as they get to a marketable size. So mo most oysters are harvested at two and a half or three years. Uh, but some of these oysters, you know, an oyster will live 15 years, uh, you know, so a 12-year-old oyster must be huge. Uh, I was once given a 7-year-old oyster in Washington State, and it, it was like this. Um, so they were e eating these giant oysters. Uh, everybody was writing about uh, Thackeray, the British novelist, uh, said that eating one was like eating a baby. Uh, <laughs> which I assume wasn't an endorsement. Um, <laughs> um, oysters uh, uh, had apparently been there for a very long time because when the Dutch came, there were these huge piles of shells everywhere. Um, some of them are still around. Uh, there's, there's one of them just north of the city that's been carbon dated to about 6,000 BC. Um, so oysters uh, have been a long-standing way of life in New York. Um, as, as New York City was developed, uh, they became very much a part of the life there. And in 
the 17th or 18th or 19th century, if you were to say to someone, I'm going to New York, invariably they would have said, enjoy the oysters. That's what you did in New York, is you ate oysters. Um, and uh, oyster stands sold oysters on every street corner. And there were uh, these places called oyster cellars, cellar with a C, that um, uh, specialized in, in oysters. They were this typical New York City space, you know, where um, you have a stairway on the sidewalk and it goes partly underground, it's part basement and a little bit above. Um, and these were uh, usually in the, in the, in the slums, uh, and uh, there are a lot of women there. You know, in, until the 20th century, uh, unescorted women were not allowed in restaurants, and, and women who were in restaurants unescorted were assumed to be prostitutes. Uh, and uh, these oyster cellars were, were, were full of uh, women, you know, because of the association of oysters being an aphrodisiac. Um, you, you see this in a lot of places in the world. In the Caribbean, it's believed that uh, uh, conch is, is an aphrodisiac, and there are a lot of places that sell conch, and a lot of prostitutes hang out there in the Caribbean. It's the same kind of thing. Um, oysters... Um, uh, were sold in, in in the markets, and they used to have all these all night markets because uh, before bridges were built, uh, there were ferries from Manhattan to, to Brooklyn, and they ran all night, so the markets stayed open all night. So you know how people talk with great nostalgia about how in the old days in Paris, you used to be able to go to the Leal market in the middle of the night and have onion soup. Well, in New York City. Any time of night, you could go to the downtown markets and have oysters on the half shell or fried or oyster stew. Um, uh, I, I wish I lived in that Manhattan, you know. <laughs> it's better than onion soup. <laughs> um, oysters were uh, e extremely cheap. Uh, they had something called the Canal Street Plan, which was all you could eat for six cents. Um, and it's surprising when it's only six cents how many oysters people can eat. I mean, people used to think nothing of eating dozens and dozens of oysters. Um, and um, it was interesting to me, uh, as somebody who's studied a lot of food history, you very rarely find a food that is uh, uh, for the poor people and the wealthy at the same time served in the same way. That's a very unusual thing. But oysters were, you know, the food of all the grand banquets, and they were also the food of the slums. It was said that poor people in New York had nothing to eat but oysters and bread, which, you know, at first sounds good, but if you think about never eating anything but oysters, uh, I, I'm thinking it would get kind of old. But... Uh, um, they were uh, the one food you could always afford, no matter how poor you were. And even if you couldn't afford them, all you had to do was walk to the edge of the water and pluck a few, because uh, they were at the water's edge everywhere in New York. Um, the, in, in 1825, there was this kind of crisis in New York. Two things happened. One was the uh, Erie Canal opened up. Um, uh, in the Erie Air Canal, everything as is, is, um, is transportation improved in New York City. Oysters went further and further and became a bigger business. So when the, the um, first steamships, um, th this is another th thing that is constantly misunderstood. Robert Fulton, you know, Robert Fulton did not invent the steam engine and he didn't invent the steamboat. Uh, what he did... Uh, was he invented the first commercial steamship line that made money. The previous attempts had all gone broke. And his line was um, from the East River in Manhattan to Albany, and they carried oysters uh, to, to Albany and to upstate New York. And then the, when the Erie Canal was built, which connected the Hudson to the Great Lakes, so it meant you could go by boat from New York City 
to the Great Lakes, and then there, were, there was a canal called the Ohio Canal that went from the Great Lakes down to um, the Ohio River, which connects to the Mississippi. And you can see that, you know, a lot of North America suddenly became available by boat, and, uh, and they carried oysters. And when, when railroads started connecting North America, they carried oysters. And you can see in cities like St. Louis and Denver and San Francisco, as soon as they got a rail connection to New York City, you can look in the archives and you'll see ads in all the papers saying, New York City oysters coming. Um, but when the Erie Canal first opened in 1825, and they wanted to have all of these very grand banquets and celebrations because, you know, whenever political people spend a huge amount of taxpayers' money, they want to cap it off with a large celebration so we can feel good about it. <laughs> um, and, uh, and they realized to their great embarrassment that there really weren't any grand restaurants in New York City. There were just, you know, these oyster cellars and oyster bars. And then, you know, I mean, what, what is the worst thing uh, that can happen to uh, people who are feeling insecure about their restaurants? Just have a famous French person come, right? So the Marquis de Lafayette, his first return to America since the Revolution in 1825, and they wanted to dine him, and they realized they didn't have any place that was worthy of taking a Frenchman. Um, and so French restaurants started opening up, the first being by the Delmonico brothers, who were actually Swiss. And, you know, um, and it, it started this, this tradition of, uh, of French chefs opening restaurants in New York, which has continued to this day. Um, and, you know, everything you know, for the upper classes had to be French, but everything was with oysters. All these French restaurants featured oysters. Um, uh, this is a, a quote from a man named Philip Hone. One of the great things about um, New York City history is that New York has always been New York. It's always had those things that made it different from other places, um, uh, maybe because it was founded by you know, a Dutch commercial company instead of being founded by British religious fanatics. Or, but, you know, pirates. Uh, pirates all used to come to New York and fence their goods and, and uh, uh, live in, you know, great apartments in lower Manhattan and get summer homes on Long Island and in Brooklyn. And, but if they ever tried to sell anything in Boston Harbor, they were immediately arrested and hanged, you know. Um, so, the, you know, the characters are also, you, you recognize, if, if you know New York, you recognize all these characters. Philip Hone was a self-made man uh, who became mayor of New York and then after leaving office hung on forever being very grouchy and making grouchy comments on everything. Um, uh, we've, we've got one of those now named Ed Koch. Uh, <laughs> So this is what uh, Philip Hone had to say about the new French restaurants. My wife, daughter, Margaret Jones, and I dined with Mr. and Mrs. Olmsted, the designers of Central Park. The dinner was quite a la Francaise. The table covered with confectionery and goo looked like one of those shops down Broadway in the Christmas holidays, but not an edible thing. The dishes were all handed round, in my opinion, a most unsatisfactory mode of proceeding in relation to this important part of the business of a man's life. One does not know how to choose because you are ignorant of what is coming next or whether anything more is coming. Your conversation is interrupted every minute by greasy dishes thrust between your head and that of your next neighbor, and it is more expensive than the old mode of shooing a handsome dinner to your guests and leaving them free to choose. It will not do. This French influence must be resisted. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it wasn't resisted, and, and so you had these, these many tiers of dining in New York from, you know, these places in the slums to these grand French restaurants, but everybody was eating oysters. Um, uh, and uh, there were barges that tied up 
along the rivers. And uh, on one side, they, they bought, they were wholesale markets. They, they bought from the oyster producers on the seaside. And on the street side, they looked like storefronts. So they tie up together, it would look like a block of sewers. And uh, um, shuckers would, would, would sit on the deck and shuck all the oysters. And, um, shucking was a bad job, you know. Uh, you barely earned a living. Uh, working a 10-hour day, six days a week. Uh, you were expected to do about 700 oysters an hour. Uh, a good shucker could do 1,000. You know, they used to have all these oyster shucking competitions. They still have some, but there was in the 1870s, somebody did the, uh, um, the 100 oyster record. They opened 100 oysters in three minutes and three seconds. I mean, on a good day, I might be able to open an oyster in three minutes and three seconds. <laughs> um, and it was uh, um, just, you know, the New York life. Um, Charles McKay, uh, who was a popular songwriter, wrote this description of New York. You know, everybody came to New York. Um, and ate oysters and wrote about it. So, you know, Dickens and all of the, the – Jose Marti, the Cuban independence leader, and all, all these people who came to New York wrote about the experience of eating oysters there. Charles McKay, who was a popular songwriter, wrote this story. It is related of an amiable, amiable English earl who a few years ago paid a visit to the United States that his great delight was to wander up and down Broadway at night and visit the principal oyster saloons in secession, regaling himself upon fried oysters at one place, stewed oysters at another, upon roasted oysters at a third, and winding up the evening by a dish of oysters a la anglaise. On leaving New York to return to England, he miscalculated the time of sailing of the steamer and found that he had an hour and a half upon his hands. What shall we do, said the American friend who had come to see him off. Let's return to Broadway, said his lordship, and have some more oysters. Um, it, if you look at the um, uh, New York City newspapers of the 18th and 19th century, uh, it's, it looks to me like they had oyster correspondence. You know, there, there were constant articles about oysters. And if a new bed was discovered, it was a front page story. And they had editorials about oysters. This is an example from Harper's Weekly magazine in 1872. See if you can figure out what they're talking about. The delicious bivalve was familiar to the ancients. Their indulgence, however, never encouraged tyranny or degenerated into despotism, as did the love of peacock's tongues, nor were they ever known to share the demoralizing tendencies necessarily incident to the unrestrained consumption of pâté de foie gras. I don't know. Um, in... Uh, the latter part of the 19th century, what's called the Gilded Age, um, when there were 400 millionaires in the United States, and most of them lived in New York and the others visited, um, they started to create these very sumptuous restaurants for the nouveau riche, basically, um, and they called them lobster palaces. Um, although they serve more oysters than lobsters, which wouldn't call them oyster palaces because oyster palace would not denote luxury. Um, and uh, the wealthy would, uh, would go to these places and just eat enormous quantities of food. And a, a popular journalist of the time, Julian Street, wrote this description. Um, he lives very high... And when he comes to die, he does it so quickly that he actually interrupts himself in the midst of ordering another bottle. His color changes. If he was purple, he turns mauve. If cream colored, a lovely shade of pale green. An attentive waiter catches him as he starts to flop over on the wine cooler. He has stopped ordering, so his friends know he must be dead. Um, the most famous... 
habitues of these oyster palaces were Diamond Jim Brady and Lillian Russell. Uh, Diamond Jim Brady was a New Yorker um, who uh, grew up in a poor Irish neighborhood and made a fortune selling railroad equipment. You know, in the 1880s and 1890s, railroad was what uh, high tech is today. It was the, the, the new industry that fortunes were made in. Um, and Lillian Russell was an actress who was said to be um, the most beautiful woman in the world, um, from the Midwest, actually. Um, Oscar Cherky, who was a um, major D at the Waldorf and before that at Delmonico's, described the first time he saw Lillian Russell, he said, I remember the smooth flow of her blue gown, the exotic effect of her golden hair, but most of all, the banked down fire that smoldered in her beautiful face. She was the loveliest woman I had ever seen. What he's not saying is that there were about 300 pounds of her, um, all, you know, cinched in with the miracle of whalebone. The two of them were, were enormous, uh, and, and they... Uh, were known to eat legendary quantities of food, including dozens and dozens of oysters to start the meal. And Diamond Gin was a teetotaler, and he would drink a couple of gallons of orange juice. And, you know, they'd have a few steaks, a couple of pies. Um, and the same Oscar Cherky um, described as the greatest disappointment in his life one time when he waited on them in a private dining room and discovered that most of this food that was going in there was being eaten by Miss Russell. And that Diamond Jim was actually eating pretty moderately. Uh, Cherokee was, was absolutely crushed. Um, uh, Diamond Jim used to say the way to eat oysters was that you, um, um, you sat with your, your belly a few inches from the table and uh, uh, you ate till you were touching the table. Um, so, and what happened to all of this? Um, to explain this, I, I'd like to go back to Dutch times. Um, in, uh, in Dutch New Amsterdam, um, there, was a, um, there was a lake, which the Dutch called the Kalk, uh, which means lime, which is what oyster shells are made out of. And there, the Indians had left a huge pile of shells. Uh, and it was apparently a beautiful lake, and um, people used to like to picnic on the hill above it and look at the, the, the view. Um, and uh, because the, the colony of New Netherlands was being so unprofitable, the frustrated Dutch West Indies Company brought in somebody to shake things up. They brought in Peter Stuyvesant, who was... Um, you know, known to be a, a, a tough guy, extremely irritable and uh, a little bit racist and um, uh, unpleasant. And uh, um, he was, in fact, the 17th century Rudy Giuliani. Um, and uh, uh, the first thing he did when he came is he, he brought slaves with him because he had been in Curaçao, which was a big slave market. And with these slaves, he built the wall that Wall Street is named after. Um, and you may have learned in school, I learned in school, that this wall was built to keep the Indians out. Turns out that's not what it was at all. It was built by Stuyvesant to keep the British out, which is very odd because, I mean, why would the world's greatest naval power attack a seaport from the land? Well, you know, they wouldn't. And they didn't. <laughs> they came from the, from the sea, and they took New Amsterdam without firing a shot. And after they took it over, they tore down this wall, which was useless. Uh, and when they tore down the wall, everybody looked past it at, you know, where, where the beautiful lake used to be. And there was just garbage everywhere because when the wall was up, Everybody in New Amsterdam used to take their garbage and dump it over the wall because that's what we do with garbage, you know. We throw it somewhere where you don't see it. That's why, you know, so much water has been polluted, you know. It sinks, you don't see it, it's out of sight, why worry about it? Um, 
So they looked at this, this place and they said, uh, well, this is a really polluted place. Let's just zone it for polluting, polluting industries. So, you know, tanneries and slaughterhouses and things like that were put there. And, um, and it made it worse and it smelled really bad. And um, the English called it the collect. And there were constant articles and discussion about we have to do something about the collect. And um, uh, there were all sorts of um, um, plans uh, to make an aquatic park, to um, uh, dig canals on both sides and have it be a through waterway, um, lots of different ideas. Um, but here comes the really New York part. The city said, wait a minute, this is downtown real estate. This could be worth a fortune. Let's just take a bunch of dirt and fill it in. So they did. They bought dirt and they, they filled in this pond. But, you know, it's really hard to fill in a pond. So it turned out to be not very stable land. It was just mushy and muddy and it still smelled bad. And so it wasn't worth a fortune. Nobody wanted to live there. Um, so, you know, the poorest immigrants went there, and uh, it became Five Points, the most infamous slum of 19th century America. Um, and then, of course, there was more discussion of what do we, we have to do something about Five Points, and eventually that was leveled. Um, I mention this because it gives you some insight into New York City urban planning. Um, so, in New York City, uh, going all the way back to Dutch times, there were constant epidemics of cholera and typhoid. Um, and nobody really knew where it was coming from. People didn't understand where diseases came from anyway. Um, and the most common belief was that uh, it came from uh, poor immigrants because, you know, everything bad comes from poor immigrants. Um, and then in 1855, there was a, uh, a cholera epidemic in which no poor people or immigrants uh, caught the disease. It was all, you know, notable New Yorkers. and A few very wealthy people died of cholera. And this was very shocking. It just, you know, challenged everybody's belief about what these diseases were about. So if it's not coming from immigrants in the slums, where is it coming from? And some people started saying, Maybe it's coming from the oysters. It was called the Oyster Panic. And for a few weeks, nobody would eat oysters in New York City, which was a huge thing. You know, it was the main food in New York City, and suddenly nobody was eating it. Um, and then the, the, the epidemic went away, and um, everybody went back to eating oysters. During, at, at the time, there were all of these editorials, pro and con. Um, but they went back to eating oysters, forgot all, all about this. But it, it turns out it was actually true. Um, uh, Louis Pasteur wrote that uh, diseases were caused by something called germs. And, you know, it was called the germ theory, you know, just a theory by some French guy, and who cares. But um, uh, in the 1880s and 1890s, uh, German scientists um, uh, proved the germ theory and uh, learned how when there was an outbreak of an epidemic, you could trace it to its source. And every time there was an epidemic that broke out in New York, they traced it to an oyster bed, one oyster bed or another. And then they would close the oyster bed, and there'd be banner headlines about, you know, the economic and social impact of this historic oyster bed being closed. Um, and then they would continue... Uh, doing what they had done. It, it, it just seemed a very difficult concept that dumping raw sewage on your food supply was unhealthy. Um, and, and this continued from, you know, the 1880s till 1927 when the, the last bed in Raritan Bay between Staten Island and New Jersey was closed, and then it, it, it was all over. And during this whole period of discussions pro and con about the health of oysters, um, uh, no moves were made to stop the, the, the dumping or the pollution. Uh, after the beds were closed, the water got even worse uh, with industrial pollutions. I mean, everything that could happen to a waterway happened to, to uh, New York. The first oil refineries by the Rockefellers uh, dumped into uh, uh, New York water. And uh, uh, in the 60s, during the Vietnam War, napalm, uh, that went into the, it was 
made in New Jersey and it went into New York Harbor. Uh, heavy metals, PCBs, um, and it got to the point where oysters could not even live in, uh, in, in New York water. And a after the ban, oysters were there for a long time. Joseph Mitchell, um, the New Yorker writer, wrote about how old oystering families would, uh, from Staten Island, you know, Staten Island at one time, the leading economic activity was oystering. And these old Staten Island families would go out and get a bunch of oysters just for their family, and the whole family would get really sick. But by the 1960s, uh, there wasn't even that. Uh, um, and it was found that if you put oysters into New York water, that they would become etched with acid within a week. Um, in 1970, Clean Water Act mandated that uh, New York water be cleaned uh, to the point where all New York water was swimmable and fishable. And I'm not completely comfortable about this, but they say that it is today. Um, but it certainly isn't edible. Uh, you wouldn't want to eat oysters, which now can live in New York water again. Um, uh, but oysters, uh, oysters feed by pumping in water. Uh, so they act as a filter, and they're actually very healthy for water because they eat all of these impurities in the water so that when Henry Hudson first sailed into New York Harbor, the water must have been incredibly clear because of all these oysters. Um, but um, uh, they, they can't eat up all the PCBs and heavy metals and make them go away. Uh, but you'll eat them if you eat the oysters. So. Um, environmentalists are, are replanting oyster beds, um, partly to make a symbolic point, partly because in other ways they're good for the water. Um, but uh, there won't be any oyster industry um, uh, until uh, the PCBs and heavy metals are completely cleaned up. Uh, I just wanted to end with this um, one paragraph. Jonathan Swift famously commented on the courage of the unknown original gourmet who first popped a raw oyster into his or her mouth. It is hard to explain to those who don't do it by what strange impulse humans take these primitive creatures with their tiny hearts pounding. You know, oysters, when you eat them, are still alive, and they do have these little beating hearts. Okay, so nobody's going to eat oysters anymore. <laughs> Yeah. Tiny hearts pounding and slide them down their throats. It certainly has been something New Yorkers did with passion. The best explanation is that a fresh oyster from a clean sea fills the palate with the taste of all the excitement and beauty, the essence of the ocean. If the water is not pure, that too can be tasted in the oyster. So if someday New Yorkers can once again wander into their estuary, pluck a bivalve, and taste the estuary of the Hudson in all the freshness and sweetness that was once there, the cataclysm humans have unleashed on New York will have been at last undone. But that day is still far off. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd love to take a few questions, but I just wanted to take a few minutes first to talk about um, an, another book of mine that came out um, actually very close to when The Big Oyster did, um, called Nonviolence, 25 Lessons from the History of a Dangerous Idea, um, of which the Dalai Lama was uh, kind enough to write an introduction for me to. Um, and it is a history of nonviolence. Um, showing that uh, nonviolence like violence is an idea that has always been with us and has a very long history. Um, and um, uh, that actually when you, when you look at it, uh, it has a better history of success than violence, which never worked very well. Um, and that, you know, these ideas didn't, you know, like Martin Luther King, did not suddenly come up with the ideas of nonviolence for the civil rights movement. Uh, they came from um, uh, World War II draft resistors who in turn were inspired by what Gandhi had done in India, who was in fact inspired by um, uh, early Christians and Hindus. And uh, 
uh, there's, a, there's a very long history to, to all of this. It's not, uh, you know, a new and crazy idea. Um, uh, I'm hoping it's an idea whose time has come. Uh, I think that eventually people have to realize that the way of solving problems is not this kind of slaughter and destruction of people and their families. Um, and I often think about something that Robert Kennedy said in 1968 when he ran for president. He said that we live in a democracy and if you don't believe a war is right, you have a moral obligation to stand up and say something about it because it's being done in your name. Thank you very much. Who wants to ask a question so I can repeat it? <laughs> this is actually to test my memory and retention. <laughs> yes, sir. Ah, <laughs> do you think this is related? I hope they're picking this up because there's no way I'm going to repeat it. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> Um, yeah. Okay, this wonderful man has been reading my books for years. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, I came to Atlanta for a chosen few. Yes. Uh, um, So the, so the question was that some of my books uh, uh, seem to be history through culture and others are uh, more history through commerce. And, and uh, um, yeah, I don't um, – it's actually not neatly in that order because, you, you know, I, I, the, the Bass book was after the Cod book. And, and, you know, and there's a lot of, and then I'm not sure where the 1968 book fits in. And, and, then, and then there's the fiction, uh, there's my fiction books. And uh, it, it's always very hard for me to answer these questions because I don't really um, conceive of book ideas with the, with, with the sort of um, uh, Forethought. I was going to say malice, but there really isn't any malice. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I look for um, uh, first things that are good stories and stories that mean something. Um, and I've done the different books I've done for, for different reasons. Uh, uh, A Continent of Islands, my first book about the Caribbean, I, I did um, – because I thought there was a very moving story in the Caribbean and a story that doesn't really get told, um, uh, which was also true of a, a Chosen Few, which was about Jewish communities after World War II. Um, 
and uh, um, I wrote Cod because I thought it was this great story that would really, you know, uh, alert readers to what was going on in, in the oceans. Now, if you set out to write a book about overfishing, um, you know, I, I see a few of you have already nodded off when I said the word. <laughs> but, 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 you know, here was, I realized this great story that, that would make the whole thing make sense. Um, you know, in the Basque book, I, I, um, I thought the Basque book really, uh, in a very interesting way, raised the whole issue of what is a nation and what is a people. There were very different reasons for, uh, um, uh, for all of these books. So it's, it's, it's not like I, I, I had an idea of history that I was trying to follow. Uh, I'm not nearly that orderly or no, organized. No, no, no. What was interesting about the, the God book is that, like, exploration happened because of that, because people were going places to find God. Yeah, I mean, I do, I, I do have this great belief in the, in the historic importance of commerce. Uh, commerce really is one of the great movers of history. Well, I guess that was my question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Yes, sir. I, I have always wondered who had the nerve to eat cod liver oil, uh, especially. But, you know, originally cod liver oil was, was made by, you know, taking the levers, livers and keeping them in, in, a, in a barrel until it fermented into this black muck that you sort of spread on your body as an ointment. And then one day somebody said, let's eat this stuff. <laughs> Okay, the question is how I think the, the, the Basque situation in Spain is going to end up. Um, and, of course, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> but uh, um, uh, I, I think it's a problem um, like the Irish problem that will be resolved uh, when, the, when the Spanish um, – get as tired of it as the British got. Um, I'm very frustrated at the moment because uh, the, the Spanish, by a very narrow margin, elected a very good man, Zapateros, um, who for the first time in, uh, uh, since the Spanish Civil War, it's the first government since the Spanish Civil War that has tried to negotiate in an honest and fair way with the Basques. And, um, and there was just an attack in Madrid, um, which, of course, puts up a terrorist who is in power by a very narrow margin in, in a hopeless situation. So they're, you know, ruining this guy for his good faith. Um, but when I say they, who am I saying? Because it's not the great majority of the Basque people abhor this violence. It's a very small group of people. And I think, I have no real knowledge of this, but I think that this attack was an even smaller group, a splinter group from the, the group. The, the, the group had said we want to negotiate uh, peace, and it was working quite well for them. You saw the same thing happen with the IRA. When they first started negotiating, a group splintered off and did some attacks, uh, I think, in London. Um, uh, I think this is a critical moment. Will they get past it, or will Zapateros be overthrown if the if the if the uh, right wing comes back in? Uh, they base their whole uh, political platform on hatred of the Basques, uh, uh, and it, and it will go on if the, if if that happens. Um, uh, the, the problem isn't really uh, how the Basques can get an independent nation. Uh, um, it's, it's not even known how many Basques want an independent nation. What the Basques want is the ability to be Basques, to preserve their culture, to be a unique cultural entity in Europe, which is actually the whole idea of the European Union. Um, uh, like the European Union, they have no interest in, in having uh, 
uh, borders or tariffs or uh, printing money. Uh, they uh, just want to have absolute control over uh, their schools and their culture and um, their local economy so that they can preserve uh, their unique way of life. Um, there's really very few things uh, preventing that from happening. Um, and uh, um, uh, I think those things could be resolved through negotiation. Uh, unfortunately, some of those things are in the Spanish Constitution, and the Constitution has to be rewritten, which the Spanish don't want to do. Um, you can't have uh, referendums because uh, any moves to contemplate any break off from the Spanish state is against the Constitution. Uh, I keep hoping that the Spanish will take a look at Canada someday. I don't know. Maybe we should all take a look at Canada, you know. Uh, but, <laughs> um, you know, Canada has had this issue with the uh, Quebecois, who, um, you know, are something like a third of the population. And they have always said to them, hold referendums whenever you want. If you can ever show a majority that wants to break off, go in peace. Um, They've never gotten that majority. They've had regular referendums. There has only been one in incident of, of violence in all the years that this has been going on because the Canadian government is not trying to repress the Quebecois movement. Um, I think there's a real model there. Well, you mean in having New York leave? Yes, yes. And Well, first thing that has to happen is we want Staten Island to leave New York. They keep promising they will, but, you know, they don't do anything about it. I'm sorry, I'm not. Oh, I'm sorry. One more question. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, old idea. Um, the Romans were great believers in it. It was the food of, uh, of um, Roman orgies. Um, it, it, it may be around, you know, it, it may be older than that. Um, since there's very little evidence of it working, uh, I imagine, you know, the origin of it is their appearance. What a note to end on, but uh, <laughs> here we are. <laughs> uh, thank you all very much. I'd be glad to sign books for anyone. <laughs> Okay. Thank you all for coming. Of course, Wordsmith has books out there, and Mark will sign any and all. Thanks Other ways they're good for the water, um, but uh, there won't be any oyster industry um, uh, until uh, the PCBs and heavy metals are completely cleaned up. Uh, I just wanted to end with this um, one paragraph. Jonathan Swift famously commented on the courage of the unknown original gourmet who first popped a raw oyster into his or her mouth. It is hard to explain to those who don't do it by what strange impulse humans take these primitive creatures with their tiny hearts pounding. You know, oysters, when you eat them, are still alive. And they do have these little beating hearts. Okay, so nobody's going to eat oysters anymore. <laughs> yeah. Tiny hearts pounding and slide them down their throats. It certainly has been something New Yorkers did with passion. The best explanation is that a fresh oyster from a clean sea fills the palate with the taste of all the excitement and beauty, the essence of the ocean. If the water is not pure, that too can be tasted in the oyster. So if someday New Yorkers can once again wander into their estuary, pluck a bivalve, and taste the estuary of the Hudson in all the freshness and sweetness that was once there, the cataclysm humans have unleashed on New York will have been at last undone. But that day is so far off. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would love to take a few questions, but I just wanted to take a few minutes first to talk about um, an, another book of mine that came out.